Class Student Workshop. So I'll, I'll intro everyone and we'll get going. All right. We're recording. We're recording. Cool. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Daphne Adler. I'm one of the counselors here. And we've got Laura Duran from the College Career Center. And I am so, so happy to um, be presenting this workshop as part of International University Month, um, which just started yesterday. And um, this is going to be all about the UCAS application, which is for um, schools in the United Kingdom, and you're going to hear all about it. We've got four fantastic um, university reps with us um, this morning. We've got Peter Brimstone from Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. We've got Alana Stewart from University of East Anglia in England, Rachel Parsons from University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and Maggie Park, who represents Universities Wales, which is an organization that promotes Welsh education internationally. And they are going to tell you all kinds of good stuff about UCAS. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to them. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Adler. Um, so as she mentioned, we are here to talk today about UCAS, and thank you so much for having us on today. We're excited to get this opportunity to talk to students about what it's like to apply to the UK. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Alana Stewart. I'm the Regional Manager for the University of East Anglia, which is located in England. Um, I work with students in both the USA and Canada, and I am based in Michigan, so I'm one of the regional managers that is back, um, actually based on campus. And fun little fact, uh, Ms. Adler has actually been to our campus. Campus. She was on our campus in February, um, so she um, can give you kind of the in, in, um, insight into our campus um, if you need that, that direct um, advice from somebody who has been to campus. Um, so now I'll pass it over to Rachel who can introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Parsons. I'm the Regional Manager for the Americas at the University of Edinburgh. I work with quite a big North America team. Um, and we're always happy to be contacted by students uh, with any questions and I will link our contact details in the chat uh, towards the end. So anyone who has any questions they want to ask me off screen, feel free to get in touch. And I hand over to Peter to introduce himself. Hi everyone and hello again to anyone who was on the session last night and is now seeing me two days in a row. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, I am the International Officer for North America at Queen's University Belfast, which is in Belfast, the capital city of Northern Ireland. And um, so I'm one of the team there. And again, if there's anything you need to know about Northern Ireland, about the UK in general, that's what we're here for. Uh, and I'll hand over to the, to the fourth uh, country in the UK, uh, to Maggie in Wales. Hello, um, I am Maggie Park. I am from Universities Wales and study in Wales. Um, we've got eight universities in Wales, uh, so I help just kind of raise profile of all of them. So there's eight separate institutions, but I can give you the general overview. Um, I am American, but I studied abroad in Wales, uh, moved here 15 years ago, so I've made this my home. Um, so it can very much help you in your process um, if you're thinking about doing this about what it means and how it works and what it's like to live abroad as an American and then just stay abroad if you want. Um, so uh, again, I represent a bunch of institutions. So I'll put the, our general website in the chat. But if you want to get in touch with any of the individual unis, just give me a shout. And of course, Ms. Adler has also come to Wales. She's well traveled. Um, so she's come to our uh, counselor tour as well. So if you want to get her opinion um, about coming to Wales, she's, she's got some, some good insight. So funny. And I was supposed to go to Northern Ireland over the summer and see Queens and obviously COVID had other plans, but that will happen eventually. All right, so we will forge on ahead. It is worth noting, again, if you didn't catch it on and some of my colleagues alluded to it, but we are from all four countries that make up the UK. So that's kind of great to have um, all of them represented here today. Um, so to go over the UCAS, what it is, uh, that's where we'll start. So it is stands for the Universities and Colleges Admission Service. So if you want to think about it, we kind of um, say it as the common application for the UK. Um, all of the UK schools are on this application, so it is kind Kind of your one-stop shop to apply um, and we'll talk about it kind of ad nauseum um, throughout this entire presentation to give you insight into all the little details um, but this is where you will apply again if you are considering the UK um, the cost is roughly comparable um, if not even more affordable to some of your applications that you're going to be placing if you still decide to apply to the US um, so the cost for a single choice on UCAS is about 26 US dollars um, and the cost for the up to five 
five options, which is the maximum amount of schools to which you can apply, is $32. Um, we're also going to note here to um, Ms. Adler, are you a UCAS center? Just really quick, I should have asked you that before. Um, we are not currently. Okay. Um, we've We've talked about it. We just not have. We've not had enough students to really um, justify doing it. But I'll tell you what. If we get like a huge group um, starting to apply, then certainly we could talk about um, whether that would make sense. Awesome. So that is totally fine too. The reason we mention it here is if you have ties to a UCAS center, they will have a buzzword that they're able to put in and that allows kind of counselors or anybody else to track the applications a bit better. But again, no worries if, you know, LAH, LAHS is not um, yet a UCAS center, that's totally fine. You can still apply without having a buzzword or without having a tie to a center. Um, so again, it's just worth noting here that there are UCAS centers out there again, but it doesn't need to um, be tied to an application or an application doesn't need to be tied to one. So in order to prepare as you're going through, uh, we will talk about the timeline a bit later, but it's essentially what we like to say is probably around the same timeline or very similar to what you would apply to your U.S. institution. So to prepare for it as you're going through, um, you know, that maybe the summer prior to your senior year and then early on in your senior year would be scans of your quals. That's a British shorthand for qualifications. So anything like um, your transcripts that you have, maybe SAT or ACT reports, if you've been able to take those or any AP score reports would be examples of those qualifications. Also a scan of your passport, um, and then eventually you may need to scan us in your visa, um, but that's not something you would have offhand. If you are um, applying to a course that requires a portfolio, you would need to have that put together. So that would be, you know, for a lot of our art schools, maybe potentially even architecture might require, require one. It just really depends on that, but you would be working to get that portfolio um, set up and put together, um, showing strong examples of your work. You also might want to seek work experience, and with this work experience, we look for you to gain um, important skills that will be um, important to your further education, like time management, for example, but it also might be directly related to the field that you wish to pursue, because uh, this will help to build up that demonstrated academic interest, which we hope that you will reflect in your application. You'll want to make sure you understand life in the UK and what it's like. Um, all of us admissions officers or recruitment officers are great ways to find out about that. Um, also, you can speak again to your counselors at school and they can talk to you about life in the UK and what that might look like for you. Um, we understand you would be crossing an entire continent, then crossing an ocean to come over to school. So it's very important that you understand what you're getting yourself into. And further to, the, to that, making sure that you understand the university to which you're applying. Uh, so making sure that you do the work. I think there's over 160 institutions in the UK. Uh, so there's a lot to choose from and a lot to look at. Um, you know, similar to your search process would be in the US. You could replicate that over in the UK. And then finally, you'd want to make sure you have a reference. So that referee, um, that can be a teacher um, that may be in the field that you're interested in pursuing. So like if you're interested in biology, that might be one of your science teachers, or that can also be a counselor. Um, so they're going to be the one that writes that reference letter for you um, and submits it with the UCAS um, application. As mentioned previously, we do have five choices. Um, so within these five choices, you can choose um, five different institutions and similar programs at those institutions. Um, you can apply to more than one program at an institution. Um, it totally depends on what you're interested in. Um, we say that all applications should come through UCAS in the sense that you shouldn't com combine application methods. Although there are some universities that have direct applications and some that do appear on Common App, um, the, the general guidance is that you um, should probably stick to UCAS and not combine those application methods because um, there could be a problem further down the line if we do find out that you've exceeded your five choices um, within the system. So um, just for the ease of use and to save yourself from um, you know, any future headaches, um, again, the recommendation is to stick with UCAS. If you're thinking about medicine, dentistry, or vet sciences, those are some of our professional programs which are done right after high school, you can only apply to four of those programs, which gives you one remaining choice. That one remaining choice would be outside of that, the medical program or the vet program. So 
an example of this is that a lot of students who apply for four medical programs will then apply for a biomed course afterwards. Now, I think the reason they do this is that it works as a backup plan in case you don't end up getting into any one of those courses that you do still have a degree option to pursue. And then finally, if you are looking at Oxford or Cambridge, um, those take up two choices and you can only apply to one of them. So that's also important to note too. You may not apply to both Oxford and Cambridge um, in those scenarios. Um, so, and they have a little bit of a different application timeline. None of the reps on here today are actually from Oxford or Cambridge. So we're not necessarily experts on that. Oh, Daphna's got something. Oh, oh me. Um, tomorrow morning, we have a workshop about applying to selective UK schools, and it is being um, run by a rep from Cambridge. Bam. Awesome. So that's perfect because, again, we can't go over that information. We can't speak for them, but they will be able to talk to you exactly what it's like to go through that application process. The UCAS sections are very similar to what you would see on a US college application. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these for you. You can see them listed, um, but basically you're going to go through your details, provide your educational history, um, and then the other big parts of this are kind of your personal statement, which is, um, we'll talk about that actually, a longer section towards the end is about the personal statement itself, um, and then that college um, school or college reference that you would have um, to send in with that. Um, the transcripts, it's important. Um, you're probably used to having schools request them, um, you know, in official method or, you know, by an official means, maybe even snail mailing it to a university. In this case, we usually have um, transcripts, passports, and other supporting information um, that's not uploaded through the portal. So, um, again, any supporting documentation, we usually ask that that is emailed to us directly. So, again, that doesn't need to um, be sent um, necessarily in the same capacity that you might be used to. We can usually take um, transcripts emailed from students, um, knowing that we will see final official transcripts later on in the process. Then this is my last slide I will talk about. So all those sections may have seemed a little bit daunting and I think you might be wondering, you know, how am I gonna get through this? It is a different application system. There is a little bit of a difference in the terminology that we utilize, you know, just kind of those differences between British um, English and American English. But there are these awesome question mark boxes throughout the UCAS application. Um, you know, this is a little bit older, you can see the year there, but this the question marks still exist. So if you do have a question about anything or don't understand what they're asking for. Um, it's worth utilizing those boxes. There's a tons of video or there's tons of videos on the UCAS uh, website. So just UCAS.com. You can also reach out to any one of us. We're happy to help you out, um, you know, kind of through the application if the need be. And the last thing that I like to tell students, the vast majority of us, um, you know, if we need further information, if we feel like something didn't get, um, you know, reported properly on the UCAS application, we will ask for clarification um, on, on any points of data, again, that are a little bit um, questionable for us or we're a little bit unsure what, what you meant on the application. So um, it's not to say that, you know, not take it seriously, but at the same time, again, don't, don't be too scared of the application because we're here to help you. And at the end of the day, we want you to join our, our institutions. Um, so with that, I will actually pass it over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Alana. So the next section when you're filling in your UCAS form is your admissions requirements. Um, this is important because we need, we need this information to make our, our offers to you. So you're going to include um, any testing that you have taken, any testing that you are planning on taking, um, and any testing that is so schools, it's really important to have those predicted grades. And this could be a combination of AP, IB, SAT subject tests, ACT, SATs. Um, we want a full picture of your educational history. So if your school, if you're not feeling like it's a strong school, don't worry. Um, please let us know anyway. Um, we'll only take your best scores in order to make our offers to you. Um, but it's really important that you report any testing that you've taken. We are aware, of course, that there have been a lot of challenges around testing this year, and I'm, I won't speak on behalf of all the universities here, but I will say that we all have our own individual policies on um, COVID-19, on the effects of that, and any tests. So I would encourage you to get in touch with the individual reps 
um, and ask your questions if you're concerned about testing. I can speak on behalf of Edinburgh and say that we have a statement on our website for 2020 one entry, um, basically saying that we will look at college or honours level courses in your transcripts, um, but it's still really important to include details of any testing you're planning on taking, even if it doesn't go ahead. Um, other tests that may be required if you're considering a professional degree like law or medicine, you'll see here LNAT, UCAT or BMAT. These are tests that are required as part of the application process for some universities. So the LNAT for law colleagues do require the LNAT, UCAT or BMAT are for medical um, applications, clinical medical applications, and they're not the same thing. So one university will require the UCAT and one university will require the BMAT, so you can't use them interchangeably. So it's really important to check these admissions requirements on the website. Maybe do yourself a giant spreadsheet just to check you're, you're meeting all of them um, before application. Also include details of your GPA, um, course specific requirements, um, just to let you know what that means, that terminology as, as um, the terminology is different. We're talking about if you're applying to a subject like biomedical sciences, for example, um, there will be specific requirements relating to things like chemistry, um, or if you're applying to economics, there may be a specific maths level that you need to meet. And there, there's usually a variety of ways you can meet those, um, but it's important to check what those are because they will vary from university to university. I've had a note to say my sound's going in and out, so I'm really sorry. I'm gonna turn my camera off and see if that helps. Apologies, my, um, my internet has been a little bit spotty today. So if I need to repeat anything, please just know. So addition or a portfolio, this again is not required for all courses. This will be specific courses. But if there is a requirement, it should be listed on the website alongside the course specific requirements. Usually these take place after application, but it's good to start thinking about them before you apply. Um, and I'll go on to talk a little bit more about interviews on the next slide, Alana, if you can move me along there. Fantastic, thank you. So with interviews, again, not all courses require interviews. Predominantly clinical uh, programs require them, um, but there might be something of a more informal interview Um, you can see here the two listed under types, the top ones, multiple mini interviews and one-on-one. -on -one. These are the most common for medicine and veterinary medicine. So multiple mini interviews are a number of different stations where they're testing different skills. So they're not testing how well you can set a broken arm or anything like that. Um, it's testing things like judgment, um, decision-making, dexterity, uh, and usually when you come to that interview process, there will be guidance from each university on what to expect. Um, obviously, due to COVID-19, we're not entirely sure how interviews will get place in person. Um, but I know, I know specifically at Edinburgh, we have conducted Skype interviews before, so it's not necessarily a new process. So it might be that those take place virtually. And again, you can get in touch with the universities to check how they will be holding those interviews. Um, I won't go through the other examples there, but that's just more to make you aware um, of the different kinds of interviews. So interview sounds very formal, but it might be that it's actually a chat or a panel um, and it's, it's something that the university will set out, make it obvious that that will happen. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise as and when you hear from them. Um, advice on interviews, um, researching the course, read around the subject, so not just the core information. Definitely practice, practice, practice. Write down some questions you may expect and get someone to interview you. Um, that can be really helpful just to kind of test out uh, your responses um, and if you have them not pre-prepared we're not talking reading cue cards or anything like that but an idea of how you could respond um, and once you've practiced saying it it does come more naturally uh, practice auditions and do remember in a in an interview usually it's two ways so have some questions prepared think about what you want to know um, except in obviously uh, next slide please Thank you. So after you've submitted your application, how does the university make their decisions? 
Um, if you have applied with all of your test scores that are necessary to meet the entry requirements, then you may receive what's called an unconditional offer. So this means you've shown that you can evidence all the skills um, and experience that is needed to meet the entry requirements, so an unconditional offer. If you have not yet completed all of your testing, so it might be that you have an exam outstanding, um, then you may a conditional offer means it's not um, a place on a waiting list or anything like that. A conditional offer means you have an offer, we're just waiting to hear back from, from an exam result. Uh, and this is where predicted scores are so important because we need to know that you're taking uh, that, that exam in the first place. So it's really important that you report all of the testing that you're planning on taking. So a conditional offer. Um, unfortunately, if we're not able to offer you a place, you'll receive an unsuccessful. So those are the three uh, situations that you will find yourself in. Once you've met the conditions of your offer, then be converted to an unconditional offer. The other option to keep an eye out for um, is that some universities will offer you a place on an alternative course. So it's worth bearing that in mind, keeping an open mind and doing some research into that alternative course. If you receive an offer for a place, um, then maybe you could check out the program structure on the website to see if there's any crossover with your original subject of interest. Um, and talk to the university reps. Um, it might be they can, they can offer you some resources so you can do some research into that, but it's worth bearing in mind that an alternative course um, could be a really great option for you as well. an interview at that next stage after you've received your offer. They might ask to see your portfolio and often the deadlines are listed on the website. Um, portfolios can be uploaded through a specific university portal. Um, they should provide advice and guidance on how you can find that portal. Um, or you might be asked to take an admissions test if you haven't quite evidenced all of the skills um, or subject requirements that you are necessary for the course you've applied for. So next slide, please. So the next step for you, uh, once you have hopefully received all of your your firm and your insurance choice. So if you hopefully receive five offers, you then have to whittle down your choices to just two. Your firm choice, which is your first choice, um, and your insurance, which is your backup. So usually the insurance entry requirements may be a little bit lower than your firm choice. Um, and there are some options if you do not receive any offers. Uh, the next step in the process would be to look at UCAS Extra, which is where um, open places are listed. Um, and then the next process is clearing, which is where universities report all the spaces that are still open, still accepting applications, and you can look at that through UCAS. Um, you can check the status of your offers in UCAS Track. Um, so if you're not certain how many offers you've received, you can go to Track and have a look. You can reply to your offers through Track and set useful date reminders, although I would recommend putting them in your calendar as well. So although they are available in Track, also putting those key dates, and there is a list of key dates on the UCAS website into your calendar. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at the timeline. Um, you can see here in year 11, start your research. You're looking at your options, you're considering where you might want to go, which programs you're interested in. Um, you can explore those interests through summer schools, um, and then you can start drafting your personal statement. You'll see that goes on for quite some time. Personal statements, we do recommend you start drafting them early and redrafting and redrafting and reading backwards and checking for typos. They're only 4,000 characters. I know that we'll talk a bit more about personal statements later, but I can't recommend um, enough starting that process early. Don't leave it all to the last minute like I did. Um, so the next step in the process in year 12 from September open. So this is when you can start submitting your applications. Um, in October, November, where we are now, uh, redrafting that personal statement, getting ready for submission. Um, and the first deadline you need to be aware of, and I know that um, your Cambridge presentation tomorrow will talk more on this, but the 15th of October is the deadline for medicine, 
Oxbridge Veterinary and Dentistry programs. So um, opens in September and that deadline comes around very quickly in October. So if you are going to sit a medicine entry exam like UCAT or BMAT, these need to be completed before you submit your application applications. So alongside that research that's taking place in year 11, you also want to be looking at any tests that are required for entry and making sure you schedule them in. Uh, so the next deadline for all other subjects is the 15th of January. This is the deadline for equal consideration. So equal consideration means that if you submit your application before that date, you will be considered on an equal basis to any other student who submitted before then. Um, most universities will stay open after that January the 15th deadline uh, for international students. However, competitive programmes may fill up. And I know at Edinburgh, we definitely recommend you that January the 15th deadline. So the next stage in the process after that 15th deadline, uh, that's when you will start receiving your offers. Um, and you have to make your decisions um, as to which will be your firm and insurance choice. To do that, usually the universities run the helpful sessions to kind of give you a sense of um, what the, the process might be, um, what information you might need to make that decision. So do check the websites to make sure you're attending those sessions and you've got all the information that you need to make that choice. Alongside that process, you might want to start looking at scholarships. Usually the deadlines for these are quite early, so it's, it's definitely recommended that you check scholarships when you are applying. Usually you have to have an offer to apply for those scholarships, but each university will have their own policies on that. If you don't receive any offers, you can start looking at UCAS Extra from uh, March um, onwards, um, and this goes up to July when the clearing process starts. You'll see here that the next steps, if you have um, decided on your firm and insurance choices, uh, you can start applying for accommodation. You can uh, make sure that you've submitted all your qualifications, by which we mean all of your test scores. Um, and so the CAS or the CAS is an alphanumerical code um, that is basically your confirmation of acceptance of study. So this is the university saying you've met all of the qualifications and requirements that we need. You are an unconditional firm student at our university um, and you can start making your visa application. This process, we can't issue those CASs until three months before the start of your programme. So don't worry if you haven't heard anything in April, um, this process does start a little bit later. Um, the design courses, but again, this does vary by university. At Edinburgh, for example, I know that we definitely still recommend you apply for the January the 15th deadline um, for our art and design courses. So do check with the individual university. If I can go on to the next slide, please. And I will hand over to Maggie to take you through personal statements. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Maggie. Um, I'm gonna talk you through just a little uh, introduction to personal statements, really. It's, it's quick and to the point, but very important and very different from probably what you're used to. Um, so, as I said before, it's very short. It's only 4,000 characters. So you do need to cover a lot of ground in that short amount of time. Go to the next slide. To be honest, I haven't watched this bit, so I'm not sure what this one is. <laughs> we only have the PDF. Can you, um, can you hear the volume? Let me see on that hold on let me if not we can share the link to it can't we it is a video so i don't know um we might have technical issues with this but let's see hi alana i've uh, come but, across this before to your you sharing options and click unfortunately yep. not but if you go to your sharing options yes there should be one to click to say share computer sound let me see if I can figure this out. The little green bar at the top there. 
well, we can skip it and come back to it. Yeah, we can skip. I mean, I'm going to cover basically the same info. So why don't we okay, share? Okay, wait, I got it. it. I got it. I think we're good. Audio Is it going? It's scary. You're sitting there, there's a blank sheet of paper, it's in front of you, you've got to fill it up. You've got to talk about yourself, you've got to talk about your interest in the course. But what do you put? This is your future. It's scary. Well, nobody knows you better than you know yourself. You have the opportunity now to show why you're so much better than everybody else applying for your course. So you've got to start thinking about what makes you stand out, but stand out in a good way. I'm Jane Marshall. I work for a university. I spend my life reading personal statements. I read lots of them and I mean lots. That means I know what makes a good personal statement and what makes a bad personal statement. You have to remember everybody's unique. There are lots of different ways of going about it. So this should get you well on the way to writing an excellent personal statement. So where do you start? Well, the first thing you need to do is start getting words down on that blank sheet of paper. Loads of them. Whatever you can think of. Why are you so excited about the course you're applying for? What is it that gets you really excited about that particular course? What floats your boat? Be excited. Be positive. Don't be negative. Don't say something like, I've always wanted to be a dentist because it's so much easier than being a doctor. Because that isn't positive. Focus on the positives. Tell us how you got excited about this particular course. Uh, did you read an article about something? Did it get you inspired? Did you then go and see a lecture from somebody that made you think, wow, I'm so excited. I'm going to write a project on that. That's the sort of thing we're looking for. And you can get all of this evidence from work experience, outside reading, all the sorts of things you do that back up your interest in the course. So throw those examples at the page. Get excited. Once you've got the stuff down about the course, then you've got to start thinking about the skills you've got that would help you cope with that particular course. Transferable skills, stuff like communication, essay writing, leadership, that sort of thing. And you've got to start throwing more words at the page until something sticks. If you're getting stuck, ask your friends and family. They might be able to come up with some ideas. Occasionally they don't. Avoid saying things like, I know I can be an excellent teacher because my friends tell me I'm really good at telling people what to do all the time. Because think about what that's saying about you. Then think about what's exciting about you, what makes you unique. Think of what you do that's interesting, what makes you stand out. And remember, you may not think it's interesting, but somebody else will. You might like gaming, you might like gardening, you might like train spotting. So will somebody else. So get something like that down on paper as well. So, what do you do next? You've got this big sheet of paper with all of these words on it and you've got to get it into something resembling a personal statement. That means you've got to squash it, you've got to condense it. So you need to start off with a really punchy opening paragraph. This is the bit where you tell us how incredibly excited you are about the course you're applying for and that you really understand what it is you're getting yourself into. Then you move on to the middle paragraph. That's the chunky bit. That's full of all the evidence you're going to need to prove your interest in the particular course. You're also going to sprinkle in some of the bits about your skills and good qualities so we know you can actually do it. But that's your middle paragraph. And then you move on to the end bit and that's the bit about the personal touch. This is the bit where you tell us you are unique. You tell us about the things you're interested in that will help you fit into university life as a whole. So, what do you avoid? Well, the first thing is verbal diarrhoea. You've got to keep focused. You haven't got enough space to go off piste, so make sure you're being relevant about the course you're applying for. That's really important. Other things to avoid. Showing off. Don't be arrogant. It's absolutely fine to back yourself up using lots of relevant examples. That's called good showing off. But don't be bad showing off. That is arrogance. Avoid flowery language. Keep it to plain English. We need to understand what you're actually trying to say, so avoid the honour and the privilege of a particular work experience. Just focus on plain English. Avoid cliches. I don't want to see anybody saying, I've wanted to be a doctor ever since I was born. Because you haven't. That's rubbish. Keep it to actual, normal, plain English. Copying. Don't copy. They have some software called Copycatch. It will catch you if you copy somebody else's work. So they're the things you need to avoid. So, just to recap... This personal statement, you've got to show us that you know what you've applied for, you've got to show us how excited you are, you've got to give us examples. Make sure it's a combination though of head and heart. Be authentic, be focused, but be enthusiastic. That's what we're looking for. You're not going to get it right on the first go, but keep coming back to it. You'll get it right in the end. And eventually you'll have a fantastic personal statement that tells us all about you. Okay. Well, she was a little bit scary for saying, don't be scary. I don't know about you guys, but she was quite intense. Um, 
But all of those points are really spot on. We, again, like I said, I hadn't seen that before, but that's pretty much what we're gonna walk through. So I'll just pull out a few important bits from that if we can get back to the presentation. Blank sheet of paper. Nope. Yep, let me figure this out. How to, no <laughs> how to get out of the video now. Of course, but what do you Yeah, do? I know, that's what I literally just, okay, here we go. <laughs> Woo! Crisis averted. All right, well there done. you go, Maggie. Well done. <laughs> Tech man, we're all figuring it out, it's fine. Okay, so uh, if you want to click through these just to get them up, that's fine. I'll kind of talk around them. Um, so personal statements. In the U.S., we're really f used to talking about summer camp or our moms or, you know, the best horseback trip I ever went on, those kinds of things. Very, very different in the U.K. Um, the U.K. personal statement is very much like a cover letter to a job application. It's what have you done to prepare for this and why is it applicable to the course you want to study? Tell us about you, but 70 to 80 percent of it should focus on your academic achievements, work, um, any experience that you have, anything like that. So if you volunteered in a lab, if you read an article in a journal, if you attended a webinar, if you went to a conference, um, if you shadowed somebody in that field, really sparked your interest, those are the things that you want to focus in on. Only 20 to 30 percent is about yourself and your interests, but I would say even with those interests, they should pertain to what you're talking about for your course of study. It might be, you know, I'm also an avid rock climber, but that really instilled my inspirations for outdoor education. So you can tie in those personal things to your course, but it's definitely not as much about I'm president of my swim club and things like that. It's much more about the academic preparation. I'm going to click to the next one. So here's the main things that we're really looking for. Um, like she said in that video, that opening paragraph, punchy, who are you and what do you want to study and why? And it's not flowery, it's not Webster's defines passion as dot, dot, dot. None of us want to see those kinds of things. It's very much, you know, I, I found, this is my personal story. I fell in love with King Arthur when I was eight years old and the books that I read took place in Wales. I now want to turn that into a career. So that's actually why I moved to Wales. I read these books and I loved them. So I moved to Wales and did two degrees in it. That's the kind of passion that you want to see in a statement. Tell me what sparked your interest. Tell me what you want to study. Um, what work have you done to prepare for this? And I think that is a really big aspect that sometimes is overlooked in writing a UCAS personal statement. Um, it's what have you done to prepare for this and what knowledge do you have about the field and the industry? We're not asking you to like declare today what you want to do with your life. You don't need to know, you know, like what your, your goal in life is professionally, but we do need to know that you understand what you're signing up for. Have you looked at this, this field? You know, have you shadowed somebody? Have you read those journal articles? Are you aware of what this course actually is? Um, other things that you might want to include, you know, interests about you, what makes you you? Do you have career plans? What is your trajectory if you do have one? But I do wanna say there's not necessarily a negative if you don't have one. We want to see direction, we want to see focus, but it's also okay to acknowledge I'm open to the opportunities that this field will introduce me to. Um, if you're taking a gap year, let us know what your plans are during that gap year. And if they're completely separate from the course of study, why? What are you doing there that is a different passion that you think will, will build you up as a person? Um, and any gaps that you do have in your study, just let us know about that. I think that part's really interesting too. If, if you've ever had a, a gap in study or a drop in grades or something like that, it's okay to acknowledge that in your personal statement. Um, excuse me, I was working with a student about two years ago who one semester, she had a 2.2 GPA and the rest of the time she was a 3.5 to a 4.0 and she lost her father that term. So if that's in the personal statement and, you know, we have this wonderful letter of support, of course we can make um, exceptions, not exceptions, um, understanding of, of what that situation was. So it's okay to acknowledge changing schools, change in life. You know, there's a reason that things dropped that term. Um, but I would say don't spend too much time on it. Just acknowledge it, move on. It's very factual. It's very passionate and focused, but it's very, here's what I want to do. Here's my experience. I'm really good at this because of X, Y, Z, and I know what I'm doing. That's kind of the, the points that we want to hit with this. Okay, I think that's it for me. Over to Peter, I believe. Although I did see a question come in. Should I check on that? Oh, that's just Daphna. 
Thanks, Daphne. Ms. Adler, <laughs> apologies. Um, so yeah, just to, to kind of build and round off on what, what everybody else has said, with everything you put into this personal statement, think about think about the point in putting it down on paper. You know, we're not we're not particularly looking for you to tell us a wonderful story. We are looking to find out who you are and and what you can bring to the program. You know, everything around admissions in the UK is about finding the fit between you and the program, not between you and the school and you and the city or anything like that. It's a fit between you and the program. So what will make you stand out as a good student for the program you're applying to? Um, with the entire UK system, as you know, you, you apply to a major or at least to a, a close area of that major. Um, so say you're going to the, either the three-year system in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, or the four-year system in Scotland, there is a direction to your application. Um, so think about why you're applying to that programme and what the things you have done say about your ability to fit into that programme. So there is a list of transferable skills there, and I won't read them all out, but for everything you put in, you know, you will see terminology like extracurricular and supercurricular activities. If you're talking about something you've done outside of schooling, outside of your reading, you know, if it's talking about a, a part-time job you had at Starbucks, talk about it in the context of the skills that taught you, whether that is teamwork, whether it is time management, whatever it may be, always talk about those skills and be specific. You only have so many words and so many lines within this, so get on, get to the point very quickly. Um, we don't need to talk about how Starbucks awoke your uh, or awakened your your instincts for multinational business management and things like that. Tell us what it really did for you, because at the end of the day, you were serving coffee, so it taught you how to be nice to people and customer service and interpersonal skills. Those are specific skills, and they're realistic skills that you would have picked up. So for everything, think about. Why is this relevant? Why does this make me a good student at, for the program that I'm applying to? If we can jump to the next slide, um, what you will see over the next couple of slides is loads of advice. These questions and the questions that you have in your head will have been asked a million times before. Um, there is some advice on here, and these, these slides will be shared after the presentation. Take a look through, see what other colleagues from other UK universities have said about when you should start, what are we looking for? The key to all this is it is absolutely okay to ask questions throughout this process. Um, so as Rachel mentioned in the timeline, you wanna start this process way early, so give yourself time to ask the questions. If you're sitting thinking, oh wow, I really wanna to go to the University of Edinburgh, but I'm not sure what they're looking for, email Rachel and find out. Um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer. Um, Similarly, jump on the UCAS website. There are tons of good resources, some of them a little less intense than that video you just watched. And um, there will be things that, uh, that explain it in a bit more detail, um, but they will tell you uh, what you're going through. And the next slide is the same, um, which I won't, I won't talk you through because you guys, I'm sure, can read pretty well. Um, so for the next and final slide, um, before we take some questions, um, there's a few little do's and don'ts. If you can pull them up for me. Um, so as we've said, be reflective, think of the reason you're putting something down on paper. And um, this is why you need a redrafting process. Because you only have 4,000 characters, 47 lines essentially, make every line count. Um, mention specific things that have got you interested in the subject. If it is English with creative writing, talk about who it is, whether it's JK Rowling or J.R.R. Tolkien or whoever was your inspiration, whoever was the first person you picked up a book and you thought, wow, this is something different. Talk about that, talk about what it made you feel and what it made you think about doing that subject. And um, absolutely do not make any assumptions. Don't assume that because you've written down, oh, I had a job in Starbucks, that we will know what that has taught you. You have to tell us what it has taught you because everybody learns something different from everything they do in their own lives. So tell us what you got specifically from your experiences because this is a personal statement and the key is in the name. It has to be personal. Um, with that in mind, that list of don'ts is there. The top one is probably the funniest. You send the same personal statement to every single choice. So all five choices get exactly the same statement. So if you open up with, I have always wanted to study at Queen's University Belfast. I will be absolutely delighted and the other four choices will throw you straight out the window. But that's fine, you can come to Queen's. But it's okay. 
don't don't do that okay so remember every admissions officer is reading the same one this again is part of the reason we talk about doing your research about the major you apply to because if you have five choices and four of them are for mechanical engineering and one of them is for architecture and you start talking about mechanical engineering and your interest in physics and all of that the guys for architecture are going to look at that and go this person doesn't doesn't want to study our subject so again do the research and think about what you're putting down on paper don't plagiarize um, don't lie don't cheat it's all very bad um, uh, it's very naughty but also we will catch you and so that will be the end of your admissions journey to the uk um, and again keep it positive keep it enthusiastic and um, try to try to leave the negative stuff out there it's not like any of us have had any bad experiences <laughs> this year being a, a prime example try and talk about what you did take from it if there's anything you took from it if you haven't taken anything from a year of sitting on zoom just ignore it and talk about all the good things you had before okay and um, that is more or less it in terms of a bit of UCAS guidance we're going to jump over to questions you can ask them now please don't be afraid to ask questions but if you think of them later all of our contact details are on the screen any of us would be delighted to talk you through any of it and um, not just specific to our own universities just to UK study in general and um, so I'll pass it back to Miss Adler for question time awesome okay um, I don't know about you guys I just learned a ton and there's always a lot to learn um, so students go ahead and um, ask your questions you can put them in the chat you can just say them out loud whatever whatever works there's got to be questions and, and don't be shy because if you are wondering about something and you're afraid to ask probably someone else is wondering too um, okay so I tried starting my UCAS application and I was wondering if we should apply through Los Altos High School or as an individual because it asked for a buzzword. So I would just wasn't sure how to get started. That's um, so that, I'll go for Lana. No, I was gonna say go for it, Pete. <laughs> go for it, Peter. <laughs> or even Miss Adler. Uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was going to say that's the UCAS center bit we mentioned at the start. Yeah, so right. some, some schools are set up as UCAS centers. You can apply as an individual. It doesn't make a difference to, to us. It doesn't make a difference to your application um, or how it's reviewed or anything like that. So feel free to go through as an individual. For yep. now. And Miss Adler mentioned that you, LAHS is not yet a UCAS not center, correct. so you will probably be um, doing it as an individual at this point in time. Yeah. There is no buzzword associated with LAHS. Right. And, and we're not planning on doing that like this year necessarily, like maybe in the future if, we ha if there are enough students applying to UCAS and it makes sense to do that. Um, but for right now, um, you should be applying as an individual. And those of you asking questions, if you can say who you are, because it's, it's hard to see all of you um, and know who's talking, that would be lovely so we get to know you. I was going to say, there is also a question on the chat, um, if somebody else wants to take this, where do we enter GPA in the UCAS application? So if you are an international applicant and you're entering things that are outside of what's listed, there is a section marked other and you can self-report all of your relevant scores in that section. Um, please do include any relevant scores. Um, it's a lot of typing, we know, um, but that's, that's the information we need. So put that into the section. under other. And if you do get a bit lost, there is some really helpful guidance on the UCAS website. There's actually a video you can watch and it goes through. Of course, it won't necessarily uh, show you someone putting in a GPA, but it will at least give you a good understanding of what the next stage in each of the application. Um, so you'll know what to expect. Um, so yes, UCAS website and section marked other. Thanks, Rachel. There's another question in the chat. Okay, since the UCAS apps focus a lot on grades and test scores, what makes a student really stand out in the application process? Who wants to take that? I'll take that. Um, for uh, University of Edinburgh, we're looking for students who have a sustained interest in their subject. So being able to show anything you've done outside of your academic studies. We are a very competitive university. So a lot of students are applying with excellent grades. Um, so outside of that, the way to make yourself stand out is really to show uh, why you're interested in this subject, what curiosity you have with it, and go through that information that's been mentioned in the presentation. You know, what, 
what is it that sparks your passion for that subject? If we've got two students with the same grades, we're going to look for the one that's the best for me. So, you know, if you are applying for a psychology degree um, and you're more interested in the social sciences side of the psychology or you're more interested in the, the quantitative side, make sure the courses you're applying for do align with your interests so that in your personal statement you can say you're fascinated by quants and statistics and research is where your interest lies um, rather than, excuse me, um, rather than applying for a course just because it's something you think you might like. Um, it's really, really key to kind of do that research. That's that crucial bit to do pro before your application. Does any of my colleagues have any other? Comments? Yeah, I would just add in. Um, also, I think the, the reference is quite important in this aspect. Your personal statement more so because it's about you. Um, but your reference is really important. We only require one reference generally. So that reference needs to be from someone in the field that you want to study at in the UK. So even though you might not know your history teacher the best, but you want to study history, we need to hear from that person. Um, so it does need to kind of have that link. That being said, you can do a secondary reference as well. So if there's somebody else that knows you better or you've worked with outside of the academic ability side of things, you could su submit that one to support the application. Um, so I think that's quite important too, to just you know, if you organized benefit concerts and you want to do music management, you want to hear about that. You know, let's have that person tell us what it was like to work with you and how your initiative um, changed that event and things like that. That's a really great point, Maggie. And also just to note, you can uh, ask your counsellor to nicely combine um, references as well. So if you want to send one reference, you can uh, get those quotes from your music management teacher, you can get quotes from a subject specific teacher and put them into one reference. So you can use multiple sources and combine them into one reference. Well, that is so helpful. Thank you. I think that also answers the question too that just came in about who would we have write a reference for business um, because you might not have a business school or a course at your school. Um, you know, if you don't have economics, either economics might be a good match for that. Um, but that's where a counselor might be able to come in and write um, multiple viewpoints in that, you know, in that culminating letter, be able to speak towards you more as a student. Um, because we do offer courses where you're not maybe going to have something directly um, available to you in high school. So a course with that. So, um, you know, it is usually an academic or a counselor that we would recommend. So just trying to find the best fit for that, who is going to be able to, um, you know, kind of culminate those viewpoints to, or, you know, as Maggie mentioned, if you have worked with somebody outside, maybe doing that supplemental letter with somebody who has worked closely with you kind of more in a business setting might, might assist as well. Okay, we've got another question in the chat box. Should we self-report all our test scores or send official score reports via College Board? I can take that. Both. Um, you can self-report them and type them all in. We'll see them, but we won't believe you until we see the official reports. <laughs> so even if they're typed in there, we can make an unofficial decision based on the information input on the application, um, but we would then request the official documentation to put with the file. And can I ask a question about that too? Um, just to clarify about testing. So, you know, as we know, it's a bit tough right now um, with most of the testing being canceled and a lot of students are concerned about that. Um, so for students who are applying for this next year, um, is it correct, uh, is my understanding correct, where if a student gets a conditional offer, they have until the end of this school year to meet all the requirements, including testing, right? Even longer, they have until August. Oh, wow, super. Okay. September start. Super. So that's great to know students because it's really different than the American system where you have to have all your testing, you know, in, in any given admission cycle, you have to be done by December, right? In order to apply to American universities. So that is not the case here. You actually have quite a bit longer. So even if the testing is canceled through the fall, if some tests are able to be held in the springtime, you can still get your testing done. So that's one of the differences to note and which makes this a lot more flexible. If I can also say at this point, you should reach out to the universities you're applying to and make the connection with this US rep. 
because each of these guys at this U.S. institution is the one that will fight your corner when this application comes in. So it's worth introducing yourself to them and saying, I wasn't able to take the SATs and ACTs, but here's the information I do have. You know, are you happy with it? Is there something else? And they'll usually help you put together your application to make it as strong as it could be for submission. Right. And some schools will be super flexible in taking like APs if you don't have SAT. So, you know, bottom line, really do reach out. Like, I hope that, you know, if, if you've gotten anything from this presentation is that this is so personalized for international students. All of these representatives look really, really want you to reach out to them and they want to help you and they want to welcome you to your to their universities. And they're they're here to support you in that process. And they know that like, this is really different than the American process. Um, so whatever questions you have, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, they will totally help you and, and um, you know, the, it, it, it's a lot to wrap your head around, but you will find that once you do get the basics, um, it's very transparent and um, it, like you'll have a good idea of, of whether you're competitive for a school and any questions that you have, like they will totally help, you know, dispel any sort of confusion or anything like that around it. So I was wondering, um, looking at the education part, I, I haven't seen the other part, but um, looking at the education part, I've, I inputted my AP scores and my high school diploma that I'm planning on getting. Expect SATs, like when I'm going to do, when I think I'm going to do my SAT. Uh, we're having some sound issues. Can you hear me? Uh, a little, oh, it didn't catch most of what you said. Maybe type um, it in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then there is a question um, in the chat box. Can we submit a secondary and teacher reference? I, I believe the answer to that was yes, right? Usually, would, yeah. Would yeah. Not, but not every university need or want a second reference, they would I know for Edinburgh, we have so many applications, we usually prefer it to be compiled into one. Um, but usually if you were to submit a secondary reference, check that with your rep um, and how you can submit it. I know, for example, if we are accepting a second reference, it would be emailed um, to the admissions team directly. Uh, but we can help you because our admit we've got three different admissions teams at undergraduate level um, per college and I know it's different per university. Some are centralized, some aren't. So it's definitely worth checking. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, we've got on uh, the chat box. If you have all the academic requirements for a course, do you have a good chance of being accepted? I'd, sorry to jump. I'd, I feel like I'm dominating here, but um, just to just to say, at Edinburgh, unfortunately, having the minimum entry requirements does not guarantee you an offer. Um, it is a holistic look at your application. Um, we do look at your grades, but we do look at other qualities as well. If you're applying for a very competitive course, we can't guarantee. It will depend on the field of applicants that apply per year. So depending on who else is applying um, will depend on what our kind of threshold is. So the most important thing, rather than focusing on admission statistics, <coughs> is to put it in represents yourself. That's, that's the key thing to remember. Um, does any of my colleagues have any other kind of notes on that? I mean, I would, I would say similar. Obviously, it's a great thing if you've met the academic requirements. It does, it gives you a chance, but what you have to go in assuming is that we will be getting applications from students all around the world who have also met the academic requirements. So I think it's a safe bet to assume that they will get you one step of the way, but the personal statement and the letter of reference will seal the deal. And that is your chance to differentiate yourself from other candidates who are also very clever. Cool. And I would add to that too, you guys. Um, so with the UK, as, as you heard earlier, you can only apply to five programs, right? This is very different than in the US where you can apply to like however many you want. You have to choose these very carefully. If University of Edinburgh or wherever is like a big reach for you, there's really no point in applying there. It's not like here. Um, if they're telling you these are the bare minimums and you don't have those, you're wasting one of your five chances. Um, so you really want to choose these very carefully. Um, and it's fine to have, you know, a, a little bit of a reach, but your like your other four really, really should be a range that you, 
you have a strong chance to, to get into based on the numbers. So that's kind of the first step. And then as you're hearing the reference and the um, personal statement um, are that kind of uh, the personal voice in that in the process of really speaking to who you are. And that's what's going to help you um, to get in beyond the, the academics. Um, did we get Let's see, we've got a question in the box in the education section. What qualifications would a high school degree be honors degree level or below honors degree? Oh, okay. And then Rachel answered that below honors degree. Which GPA should we report or does it not matter as long as we specify which one? Apologies, can I ask for a bit of clarification on that one? Um, which GPA? Do, do you mean? It's weighted versus unweighted. Right. right. Yeah. Um, most are looking for unweighted, aren't they? Yeah. Um, it, as long as you clarify it, but most are looking for unweighted. It'll be clear on your transcripts. We'll be able to see um, within there what it is, but generally it's unweighted. I think also waiting to mention is a very US thing to do. So that's, I think, why we're looking at the unweighted because most everybody wouldn't have the, you know, extra points, you know, depending on the quality of course you're taking. So that's why we're looking at that, you know, not to give you fair consideration, but just because that's, again, a very US concept to be giving students extra points. Uh, okay, we have a question. Is the Republic of Ireland with UCAS, or is it just Northern Ireland? Republic of Ireland is a completely different country, so they are not part of UCAS. But you, you, but we have a workshop about UK and Ireland on the 20th in the evening, and then we've got separate sessions as well for like for Ireland, for England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland coming up. Hey, you don't need to worry about the Republic of Ireland. Just just come up north. It'll be fine. <laughs> It's a little healthy competition going on here, a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's see. So Ireland is not on UCAS, just to answer that one. Yeah, no. Um, where can we find that section again? Oh yeah, in the other section. Okay, all right. So we're at nine fifty. So we should we should get to wrapping up. Um, any last questions? No. Okay. Um, so again, like this was a ton of information. Thanks so much to all of our speakers today and students. Again, I really hope you took away like how um, personalized this process can be for international students. They really are here to help you. And we've got some links coming in the, um, in the chat box there. So you can copy and paste those. Um, I want to just point out a couple things that, that were said. So um, Maggie mentioned earlier that, you know, if something happened for you in a particular semester and you're, you, you had like a, an anomaly in your grades, right? Maybe your GPA was a lot lower or whatever. Help them understand that. Can you imagine a U.S. university being like, oh, well, that's okay if you had a 2.0 that one semester. We'll just, we understand. Not, not a whole lot of schools are going to do that, right? Similarly, the slide that Rachel was talking about with all the timelines, right? All the ones with the, um, the, the bars on, on it. Um, when she talked about UCAS Extra and clearing and the universities publish what spots they have available. What? <laughs> right? We don't have those sorts of things in, this, in, in, in our admission system in the US. So that, those are examples of how, um, like how, how transparent they're trying to be and how different it is. And, and like you can make choices for yourself in this process to like opt out of the pressure of the American system. It is so, so different. So think about that. Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't have to be like all or nothing, like all US or all UK or anything like that. You, know, you can apply to both, but know that there are so many ways to do this um, with the UK system and so many options. Um, so, you know, we really encourage you to come to more of the workshops and hear more details um, and ask questions. All right, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, any other last things? Um, and if, if um, the rest of the reps want to put, put your contact info, um, 